Alright. So, uh, my name is Edward. I'm the head of engineering for the Adam Foundation. Um, I, I do live in Taiwan. We're kind of a distributed team. Uh, we have uh, people in I think 13 or 14 different countries, uh, mostly in Europe. Uh, some Asia, Australia, US, and so on. Uh, but I, I actually live here, so that's why I'm here today. It was kind of just a 10 minute ride from my house. So, uh, so today I'm going to give a talk about uh, IOTA. Um, and I know it's a developer conference, so I, I try to include some, uh, at least some snippets, just to show uh, that any developers in the room that uh, it's pretty easy to work with. And uh, it could be kind of fun, and you should uh, go download our, our, our repos and start coding stuff for IOTA. So, uh, but, but first, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the vision. So, for anybody, uh, could you show of hands like who knows what IOTA is? Who has heard of IOTA? Who knows it? Okay, so like a few. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> IOTA, the name uh, IOT is in there, right? And we're building a, a platform for the IoT, ultimately. Uh, and so I'm just going to run through some example use cases of like where we think uh, IoT will go in the next uh, four or five, six, whatever years. Um, so a good example to start with is always mobility. I think it's, um, it's one of my favorites. It's really easy to understand. We all ride around in vehicles quite frequently. Um, and so if you had a, a car that was IoT connected, that was uh, digital currency or DLT enabled, um, you could do some pretty cool stuff with it, right? You could have the car have uh, digital tokens in a wallet on board, the, on board the car's computer. When it goes to uh, look for a parking, it can check the ledger and see which parking spaces are available uh, and drive directly to one and then it could pay for the parking spot directly out of its uh, onboard wallet, and maybe it could even pay per minute, like you don't have to worry about uh, missing the cutoff and paying for an extra hour, because you just pay directly. Uh, you could pay for tolls, you could pay for even just road use. Uh, there's a pretty cool use case uh, that we thought of where if you had uh, digital currency enabled trucks, uh, you may know that if, you, if you're driving down the freeway with a truck, uh, if you follow the truck in front of you, then you get a little gas benefit, right? There's some, uh, some drift there, and it would be nice if the guy behind could pay the guy in front to use that position, uh, and the guy in front takes care of uh, driving through the traffic, and the guy behind gets to take a little nap, and he gets to save some fuel, uh, but he would have to pay for that, of course, and today there's no real good way to do that, um, but it could be in the future. Uh, you could think about charging, you could think about uh, well, you can think about reg with regular fuel too, but of course we're talking about the future, so we're looking at EVs. Um, so you could pay a, a amount of tokens for some energy that comes into the car. There's actually already a really cool demo done by a partner where they were collaborating with in, uh, in the Netherlands called ELAT. Um, they have a, uh, it's a demo sized vehicle, it's like this small, uh, but it's a Tesla and it plugs into a Tesla supercharger, also uh, model size one. Uh, and there's, a, there's some hardware units on both sides, and the car can pay per kilowatt hour of energy directly through the, the hardware unit uh, embedded in there on both sides. And the, the, the payment, what's really cool about it, goes directly through the charging wire. So there's no, it doesn't go to the cloud or anything, there's no token payment that happens going directly through the, the charging port in the vehicle. <clears throat> so that's one. Uh, area for use cases. And to, to give you the, the flavor here, sort of what uh, all of the IoT use cases that we think about at IOTA are always um, local use cases where payments can happen between uh, machines or between uh, devices, between people uh, at a local level. And this is really important. I was actually just talking with uh, someone in the audience about this a few minutes ago. Um, right now, all of the uh, you know, payment solutions that we have go to the cloud. Uh, they go to a credit card processor, they go to a bank. And what we're talking about with IoT is devices that are exist in, in their own little geographic area, maybe even in this room or something, and they can pay each other directly, right? If I have uh, if I have cash in my wallet, I can take out 100 NT and give it to one of you, and you've received payment. I don't have to go ask for permission to give you $100, right? I don't have to have somebody else record it, I can just give it to you. And what we're thinking about IoT, that's what we're thinking about. How can uh, devices or machines transfer uh, value directly. 
Here's another really cool use case. And this one doesn't really use the token as much, um, but it makes use of the fact that you can store some arbitrary data in each uh, transaction bundle. Uh, and we're talking about supply chains here. So if, you, uh, if any of you are familiar with supply chains or logistics, it's a very complicated process to ship uh, some goods from country A to country B, right? You have to have uh, manufacturing, uh, you have to have quality control, you have to get uh, some receipt of lading or whatever going to some port, and you have to track this container where it's gone and uh, which government authorities, customs unit has signed off on it and the agricultural export bureau, whatever. There's lots and lots of paperwork involved. There's lots and lots of um, different pieces that need to be tracked and managed. And I think I heard uh, something in some talk that I'm remembering from a couple of weeks ago that I heard that in moving one container of uh, peaches from some country in Africa to some country in Europe, you needed like 60 different people making hundreds of different communications to track their containers to authorize the shipments and uh, authorize customs payments and all that stuff. And with IOTA, with a distributed ledger, uh, especially one that works, that's built for IoT for local, uh, for local use, you could do that directly through the DLT. Right, so in this image you can see like a, a farmer all the way on the left, and uh, he can put the, directly the, the result of his uh, crops and get paid for it onto distributed ledger. The trader can buy and sell directly on the same distributed ledger. A shipping company can see all the way back to the grower, uh, you know, what kind of crops they were, how much uh, the payments were for and all that stuff, and they, the authorities can track everything directly, uh, all the way down to the consumer, that's you or me, in the restaurant eating the uh, tomatoes that were produced. And I, I, I've seen, uh, I remember there was a talk a couple of months ago uh, here in Taipei, um, I heard some, some similar thing about a company that's doing just this, just for agriculture. Um, and just tracking produce that's grown and being able to see in a, uh, in a restaurant when you scan the QR code on the menu that you can see where the food was uh, produced and where, it can, where it's come, how it's been shipped. And this is something that uh, in a generic distributed ledger like IOTA, you can, this is a perfectly legitimate use case. You could just do it. Uh, so you wouldn't need to wait for uh, some agriculture or supply chain specific distributed ledger. If you wanted to do it on IOTA, you could. Uh, energy is a very uh, cool area to, to think about. Um, it's obviously one of, the, one of the biggest market segments out there. Uh, and in the last you know, 10, 20 years, we've seen a huge change from uh, oil and coal over to um, green energy, solar, wind, all that good stuff. And uh, we're seeing now this transition to um, local energy production and consumption, or micro-scale energy uh, production, as I've heard it called. Um, <clears throat> it would be pretty cool if you could have a, let's say, a solar panel farm, a local solar panel farm that provided energy for a community, and the community could pay directly for the energy as it's produced. There wouldn't be any need for the energy producer to go through some uh, big bureaucratic process to have like hundreds of uh, administrative staff tracking sales and all that stuff, if the consumers can just pay for it directly, right over the wire, uh, direct to uh, their own IOTA wallets, that would be pretty cool. Uh, and there's some, I, I have another slide in a minute that shows uh, exactly how that might look. I, I think it's a very interesting thing to think about. Um, data, of course. We have, a, we have a saying that I guess, uh, maybe it's not from us, but uh, there is a saying out there that data is the new oil. Uh, if you think about why it is that companies like Facebook and Google and Apple uh, have gotten so big in the last decade, it's because of their, um, their willingness to collect and distribute and monetize data, right? So you can do a lot with data today. And uh, one of the problems that we've seen from companies like Facebook and Google is that they have very limited respect for data privacy. Uh, they have very limited respect for the way that they collect data and for what they do with it. And using a distributed ledger, using some uh, now common cryptographic techniques, uh, you, can, you can do some cool things with data where you can keep the data private, anonymous, secure, but you can still use it to monetize. And in IoT, uh, where you have all kinds of devices all around that are continuously collecting data through all kinds of various sensors, that data might be useful for someone. But uh, there's no, today there's no real incentive to keep it. 
So if you, uh, a great example is uh, our colleagues here in, uh, in Taipei B Labs, uh, one of them is in the room, uh, they have developed a, a, an air sensor called Airbox, which measures uh, temperature, humidity, and also pollution levels. And it uh, records it onto some ledger. And uh, in this case, they've used IOTA. And why have they done that? Because if you just record this data, and I give you an Airbox, and I say, all right, plug in the Airbox at your house, uh, and let's record, let's get more data points for pollution uh, records. Because there's only you know, 12 in Taipei, it's not that many. We don't really have a good understanding of how pollution looks in Taipei. But what's your incentive to do that, really? There isn't one. Um, just maybe the, out of the goodness of your heart. But if your pollution sensor is connected to a distributed ledger, which does value transfers through uh, cryptocurrency, then you can actually get paid for that data. Right? So you can plug in your airbox, you can collect pollution data, some researchers are interested in it, boom, they can just buy it from you directly. They don't have to, you don't have to go through some third party provider, you don't have to be on any platform, you can just sell your data uh, in small amounts to people who are interested in looking at it. So if you put this, these kind of ideas together, these kind of IoT ideas, these kind of local um, payment ideas, uh, machine to machine payments, you can come up with some pretty interesting uh, all around concepts. And I think one of the most interesting that I've heard of is like smart cities. So in a smart city, you can imagine, uh, let's take a trip into the, into the future, and you imagine a smart city powered by a distributed ledger, uh, a local distributed ledger that doesn't depend on cloud services. So all of this stuff happens directly between the machines in the picture. So uh, <clears throat> an electric car goes out and pays uh, ch some charging station for energy, and it comes back and plugs in at the charging station outside of its house. Maybe one of the, one of the houses, maybe the smaller one in the corner, uh, didn't collect enough uh, solar energy during the day, and it needs some extra energy. And so where could it get the extra energy from? Well, it could get it from a power company uh, who's burning coal and oil, or maybe you can get it directly out of that car battery, which had a little bit extra from the day that it charged. And wouldn't it be cool if the homeowner could pay the owner of the car directly to get the excess energy out of the battery of the car? Like that's something to me, that's a little bit mind blowing. You have to kind of think about it. But the car goes out, charges up in the, sta in the charging station in town, goes back home, and the neighbor needs extra energy, my car battery has extra energy, I'll sell it to you directly. That's a very cool idea. And I haven't heard of another uh, distributed ledger or such that could kind of account for that situation. For me, the, what, I, what I've heard of that I think may work is something like Iota. Um, and what we're talking about in all this stuff is a machine-to-machine -machine economy, and really the machine-to-machine -machine economy is for us, right? It's for people. So, uh, yes, we're talking about machines being able to pay effectively money back and forth between each other, but why do we want them to do that? Because it's more convenient for us, right? It's better for, uh, let's say, green energy. It's better for increasing our standard of living. Uh, it's more convenient, it's faster, and all that good stuff that technology gives us. This is another step uh, in that direction. And at the end of the day, we want, we want to build all of this IoT stuff to benefit us, right? It's not for uh, cyber, lord, cyber overlords or whatever. It's to make our lives easier and better. So here's the question. If you're thinking about all of that stuff I just talked about, about IoT, about machine to machine payments, about local payments, um, about uh, getting energy directly out of your neighbor's car battery, doesn't the internet already do that? What do you think? Does the internet already allow you to do that?
a l t a 本身它没有 mining 的机制，那对新加入的用户，你要怎么确保它的，就是你把 a l t a 的币分享出去是公平的？嗯、uh, ，Okay, so the question is,、uh, how do you guarantee that the distribution of i o tokens was done in a fair way? Is that the question? Okay, so.、Uh, So the, the, this is the difficulty for any cryptocurrency on the market, right? Like at the at the moment, the cryptocurrency、uh, distribution is generally done through like an ICO, token sale, something like that. And IOTA was not different. So the IOTA tokens that you may have today in your wallet or on an exchange came from a token sale in 2015, I think.、Uh, on it was on like a forum. It was totally random. You paid some、uh, one of the IOTA guys at the time.、Uh, Bitcoin and he gave you IOTA. Like that's that was how the sale happened. So if you're talking about fairness, then、uh, yeah, sure, there may be some some questions there. So what we're what we're really talking about here, though, is the、uh, let's let's think of it as a proof of concept, right? So I don't want it, I don't want us to think that the IOTA tokens you have in your wallet today or on your、uh, exchange wallet today are the actual. I have the tokens that we're going to be doing all of this stuff with all around the world in 20 years from now, right? I mean, maybe it would be. I don't know. But what I want to focus on is the tech and how this can be done, not necessarily that it should be done exactly the way that it has been done today, if that makes sense. Because for, for for me, that's at least for me, that's the important part, right? Is the tech proving that it works, proving that people will use it, and I think.、Uh, Your question is a good question about the fairness of that. I think that will not prevent it from being used,、uh, at least in small scale, at least in some ways, at least to prove that it does work and that people want it. And of course, everything we do is open source, and you can,、uh, when you have a better idea in the future, you can make your own version、uh, and distribute it more fairly. Or maybe even we would do that、uh, and distribute it more fairly、um, with some open governance model or whatever. And then that that future version will will take off. I don't know. But.、Um, I think the the question here is a little bit different, right? Because we're talking about IoT, and my question is, doesn't the internet do all that stuff already? And IoT means a lot, Internet of Things. And I think there's this、um, I don't know if it's a misunderstanding or just a regular understanding that、uh, the Internet of Things works on the internet. So like, you have、uh, some device, a sensor, a drone, a car, a phone, whatever, and that somehow that device, that thing, should be connected to the internet. To make it part of the Internet of Things, but that's not really how we think about it.、Um, by, by the way, feel free to ask questions. I, I like that. That's good.、Um, so here's like the basic requirements, at least that we see of this kind of system, where you can have local payments,、uh, where you can have machine-to-machine -machine transactions. Right. The first thing you have to be able to do is trust your data. So on the Internet today,、um, you you don't really have a great、uh, mechanism for trust. I mean. Uh, everybody knows internet trolls is like a big problem.、Uh, trust in the data on the internet comes through centralized regulation,、um, in you know government regulation, or at least centralized administration of a company like Google or Facebook. But there's no real easy way to trust、uh, random data on the internet.、Um, so that's one stumbling block.、Uh, the other one is machine-to-machine -machine transactions that should be seamless. So what seamless means here is that、uh, if you think of like cash, like I take my hundred NT and I give it to somebody,、uh, they just take it. It's there's no barrier. I don't have to go through somebody else to ask for permission. I don't have to check、uh, with my government or my bank if it's okay. I just give you the hundred, and we're done. And machine to machine transactions should happen kind of the same way. And on the internet right now, that's not really possible, right? Like internet internet based. Uh, value transactions usually would go through a credit card processor like Visa,、uh, and then you have to you have to have a credit card first of all. So you have to have enough、uh, income or money in the bank to be able to get a credit card from a bank. For probably a few billion people in the world,、uh, that's still not possible today.、Uh, so they can't participate easily. Maybe then they have to use their mobile phone credit. That's popular in a lot of places, but it's not seamless, right? There's、uh, there's always A step where some human needs to be involved. There's always a step where you have to go through some 
central um, agency, whether that's government or private. It's just, uh, it's not as seamless as cash. It's not, I give you 100, you get 100, we're done. Um, and we, we need smart business models, and I think uh, the internet, the, the traditional internet has done a pretty good job of this, right? We've seen, obviously, uh, Internet 2.0 or whatever you want to call the current state of the internet has like completely expanded, huge, where now lots of business happens over the internet. But we think there could be a lot more. And uh, one of the problems that we see with the current internet is what we call data silos. So all of these companies like Google, like Facebook, they keep their data for themselves in their own data silo. They don't share it with us. So if you want to build uh, an autonomous vehicle and uh, Tesla or whoever has the most data on that, shouldn't the world have access to it so that we can, we can build one collaborating together that you know, we all think will, will work better? I mean, we've seen, this is an open source conference, right? And we know this about open source. When you have an open source software uh, and you have thousands of eyeballs looking at it and experts and researchers and whoever else, the end product is much better than having it siloed in uh, a one, one company's control, right? And so we think uh, smart business models of the internet today don't really meet that expectation. We would like to see a lot more openness um, in business models because we know that it makes a better end result. So my answer to, the, to this question is that no, the internet doesn't do that. Right? The internet is not a suitable medium for really what we want to see of a machine economy, of, uh, of the, uh, the kind of IoT that I'm talking about. So this is our answer to the question, right? It's distributed ledgers. So it means that um, all of us in the room, we can have our own uh, copy of the, the ledger, so to speak, and you, maybe you guys all know the basics of how a distributed ledger works. I don't know. Uh, I don't know who the... So who, who knows the basics of how a distributed ledger works? Like one person? <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I don't want to go too much into the technical details, although we can feel free to ask questions if you want to ask about how distributed ledgers work. But this is what we think, right? If you have um, a ledger, which is like an accounting system, and you can give that ledger to as many people as want to participate in the system. So you have a copy, you have a copy, I have a copy. Uh, then, when I give you the 100, somehow through the magic of technology, we all record it, and um, that's it. The transaction is done. I don't have to go through any central authority because I've given it directly to you and everybody knows about it. So we all accept it. We all agree uh, that the, the transaction happened and you can't, you can't fake to somebody that you're spending money you don't have or spending it twice or whatever. So we think distributed ledgers provide, uh, at least possibly, provide an answer to this, to this question um, of how do we get to that kind of vision we talked about. So why do, I, why do I like IOTA? Why do I work for IOTA? Why do I think IOTA makes sense as a, a distributed ledger that can solve those problems? Uh, there's two reasons, basically. One is that uh, looking at, obviously, the, the landscape uh, of distributed ledgers, there's like thousands of different cryptocurrencies. There's probably, I don't know at this point, maybe 50 or 100 different, like fundamentally different um, blockchain techs or distributed ledger tech. And uh, IOTA uses a, a just, a, directed acyclic graph, the DAG, or DAG. Um, and we think that the, the sort of linear way that a blockchain scales and the, uh, the way that mining works in blockchains prevents that kind of IoT vision, that sort of localized P2P or machine-to-machine -machine payments. Uh, we, we don't think it will work on a blockchain. I mean, uh, if you look at, uh, just as a basic example that I put here on the screen, if you look at any transaction that you do in a blockchain, it doesn't really matter which one. As long as you're doing a proof of work, or I guess it's true for other ones as well, but mainly we're familiar with proof of work. Uh, anytime you do a transaction, you have to pay some transaction fee. Right? So uh, if I'm trying to get uh, energy out of my neighbor's car battery in the IoT vision, and I have to pay a $5 transaction fee to do that, then I'm probably going to say that's too expensive, I don't want to do it anymore. So that's a that's a huge a huge problem uh, for using blockchains in the kind of environment that we're thinking about. And the other one is the centralization of blockchains. Right, we're trying to get away from centralization. We're trying to go distributed. We're not just trying to go to uh, multiple centralized authorities. We're trying to go truly distributed. It's difficult, uh, but that's what we would like to see. 
And we don't see that with blockchains now, right? So with blockchains, uh, look at Bitcoin, I think easily over 50% of the hashing power of Bitcoin is out of a few mining farms in China. So that means if the Chinese government wants to move your Bitcoins around, they technically could. And for me, that's a, that's a bad thing, right? We want a system where no one person or actor or government or authority would have the power to do that uh, and be, for, be able to force their opinion to everybody else. Uh, maybe it's not possible, but at least uh, we would like to go that way. So that's reason number one, is that we don't think blockchains work, and we think, on the other hand, that uh, a DAG structure makes a lot more sense. Uh, if you look at a DAG structure, which I, I don't have a picture of, maybe I should have put it, it's basically just a, a sort of random looking graph, but it all goes in one direction, uh, and it's, it looks very P2P. So each transaction in a DAG is validating other transactions in the same DAG. Um, there's, no, there's no linear process happening. So the blockchain is very linear. You have like one chain of blocks that comes out at the end as the authoritative chain. Uh, in a DAG, you have uh, transactions validating in, well, in one direction, but one another, and the DAG can kind of grow in a little bit different way. <clears throat> so we think uh, it makes more sense uh, as a sort of scalable solution. It makes more sense P2P. And one of the cool things about IOTA um, is that since you perform validation, as part of making transactions, uh, there's no transaction fees. So we don't have miners. Uh, we just have uh, node operators who like keep a history of the database and you can read the, the transaction log or the, the, uh, the ledger. Uh, but then as a, an issuer of transactions, you do a little bit of proof of work, it takes like two seconds, and you issue your transaction, and there's no other, there's no other fee. So for a machine-to-machine -machine economy, where you want to pay for one kilowatt hour of electricity, that's pretty cool. You can't have a $5 fee to pay for one kilowatt hour of electricity. It'll never work. So fee-free is, uh, is big for us. So this is reason number one why I, I think IOTA makes sense. Uh, and number two is a little bit more human reason, but I think um, the, the organization that we have set up, so I, I work, the organization I work for is called IOTA Foundation. Uh, it's a nonprofit in Germany. The headquarters is in Berlin. I say headquarters, but it's just like a small office of like uh, five people or something because uh, our team is mostly distributed. Um, but that this uh, legal structure, this uh, German nonprofit legal structure, gives us a sort of uh, really good foundation to work with from the governance side of things. So uh, you may, uh, I, I don't know if anybody's read about IOTA and seen some nasty stuff uh, on the internet, but it's the crypto space and everybody gets uh, mud flung at them all the time. But from where I'm sitting uh, inside the IOTA Foundation, I know how this looks. and to me, it's a very good um, structure to work in, right? We have, we have a board of directors, we have a supervisory board above them. Uh, everybody collectively works to make decisions for uh, how the project moves forward. Uh, we're thinking now as an organization about moving to even uh, better kind of open governance structures where the community or you or our corporate partners, whatever, would be involved. Uh, we think that's all of that openness is in line with what I've been saying in the, in the beginning of this about uh, openness in, uh, what do you want to call it, corporate responsibility or something. Uh, I think we should do the same. And ha having this foundation behind the technology, to me, is very important. Uh, it's, it's vendor neutral. It's, it's, uh, it's got all kinds of stuff going for us. So this is a big reason number two why I think IOTA is a good one. I don't think IOTA is, um, well, let's put it this way. Like I said a few minutes ago, our tech is open source. If you think you can do it better, feel free. Uh, if anybody thinks they can do a better, feel free. We have plenty of competitors that are trying. Uh, that's not the issue. Um, what, what really matters is what kind of organizational structure you put behind it to manage and govern the tech. And I think we're doing a, a pretty good job. Uh, although it's still new, so there's still road bumps, but that's fine. So this is kind of what, a, uh, maybe this goes back to your question a uh, few minutes ago, um, asking about the, the token sale and how that was fair. But we have to really look at the project uh, and what kind of maturity level it's in as a whole, on the tech side, also on the organizational side, right? So, so right now we're like in this. Uh, you can think of it. The token sale is just watering some seeds over here. I guess is the way to interpret this chart, and it's it's growing, right? But it's not uh, it's not fully fledged yet. Of course, I mean, uh, you can ask any distributed ledger uh, idea out there. I know we have one out, outside who was, I was talking to a little while ago, 
everybody's talking about sharding and infinite scaling and that, oh, our solution works, but we haven't actually proven it yet. I, I mean, it's the same for us, right? So um, there's a lot of work being done on this around the world in probably a thousand different organizations right now. Uh, they're all in an immature phase, and IOTA is no difference. Uh, it takes a long time for these things to, to mature and to really become scalable. And I think uh, if you look at the internet, it, the internet itself was no different either, right? So the uh, internet started as like DARPAnet in what, the 60s or 70s or something. Um, and it took a good 20 or 30 years for it to really become mainstream. And another 10 or 20 years after that to really become so widely used that now we're all connected all the time. So it's been a long process even for something like the internet, which now we take for granted. So I think we have to remember when we're thinking about DLTs uh, and the future IoT, internet, whatever you want to call it, that we, we'll, we'll need time to go through the same uh, sort of process. So we do have a pretty cool team though. Uh, we're right now um, about around, right around 70 and we're still hiring. Our people are everywhere. So we have on here people from, uh, from Germany, of course, Taiwan, Israel, uh, UK, um, US, Canada, Australia, Brazil, uh, we're all around the world. Uh, and we are planning to open offices. We currently have offices in Berlin and uh, Tel Aviv in Israel. We're planning to open an office here, but I'd like to hire some more people first. So if you are looking for a job, uh, let me know. Uh, and I have one of my colleagues in the room here, so you can ask him how it is. Um, and of course, uh, you know, as an organ, as a tech, we were, we're in a good way, I think. I mean, We've been, this is just from this year, right? So the Tel Aviv office opened in January this year, and now we're like eight months later. We've done quite a bit of stuff since then. We've worked with some big names. Um, we're doing a collaboration with uh, City of Taipei, uh, with Volkswagen, with UN Ops, and all of this stuff is R&D, right? We don't expect like uh, real world, everybody's gonna be using IOTA in six months. It's not realistic, but uh, to work with these kind of organizations and see what their needs are, for the tech is really important to us uh, so that we can make sure that our tech is suitable for the real world and not developed in some kind of uh, laboratory setting that doesn't apply to anything. So we need to get out there and work with these companies to see what they need. Uh, and of course you can see on here some of our own R&D stuff uh, is well underway, right? I mean it's all, it's all still new, we're working on basic stuff like the last one up there at the top right. New tip selection algorithm, IRI 1.5.0. Uh, the tip selection is like, uh, it's a little bit technical, but it's probably the most fundamental part of our technology. It's the consensus algorithm. Um, and having a new tip selection algorithm just coming out, and we need more revisions on that. The takeaway here is like, we're not, right, we're not all the way over there yet. We're not a big tree or a forest or something. We're still baby steps, but uh, we're, we're actively working on it. We think we have some good stuff, and we'll see where it takes us. Right, so I think there's a lot of room for, for growth in IOTA. Um, and that's one of the, remember the, I was trying to answer here why I think IOTA is a good uh, place to be for tech to work on. So, um, maybe I pause for a minute and ask for any questions, and then I give like a super simple, uh, it says dev demo, but I'm not gonna type anything because it's not my laptop, I just have a, pr a presentation. Um, but I just wanna show you how easy it is to work with, and like hopefully encourage you to go back and look at our GitHub and download stuff and start typing code and maybe even contributing something or writing uh, an application or whatever you'd like to do. But maybe I pause for a few minutes if there's any questions at this point. Yes? Hello. 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 Uh, anyway, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, uh, Delta is uh, rapidly growing now. And uh, uh, what the the goal in the next year, uh, You're asking the goal in next year for IOTA? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, what we would like to see is, so let me go back here. So in the beginning, I'm talking about um, this, right? This is our IoT vision. So this is not our goal for the next year. I mean, it's not, it's not likely to happen. That would be great, but I don't think so. So right now, uh, we're working with the current state of affairs, which is that most people are running code on uh, cloud providers, uh, Amazon, Google, whatever, or on their own computers, and they operate their nodes over the internet, 
and we're kind of working in that state of affairs. So uh, I, I'm doubtful that uh, we'll see, um, like, let's say, embedded devices or embedded IoT devices running IoT nodes or something in the next year. But um, what we would like to see in the next year is use cases coming out of the current network that exists on the internet using cloud providers and stuff. It's a little bit more traditional. And we would like to see some more uh, technical work being done on this on this side of things. So, so the most uh, the most possible uh, to to uh, deploy uh, the Delta. Uh, what what is the uh, uh, most possible uh, for for real world use case? You mean? Yeah, for for real world. Uh, um, so there's a. There are a few. Uh, I, so some are with some of our partners listed on here that uh, I probably am not allowed to talk about in too much detail. Um, but there's some interesting stuff coming from Volkswagen, for example. Um, there's some interesting stuff coming from uh, Robert Bosch, uh, which is another nonprofit in Germany. Um, there's it's a little bit hard to go into details of the technical use cases. I think there are <coughs> there are some some really good possibilities that I think will come out and we'll see like uh, let's call it pilots from some of these companies where they use IOTA. Can I remove? Can I remove this? Thing? So I think maybe we'll see something like demos or pilots coming from these companies. Maybe that even use. Um, uh, use it with real customers, like in a sort of pilot phase. So, I, I, I don't want to go into any detail because I'm not sure exactly under, well, like, I'm engineering, I'm not legal, I don't know about all of our NDA deals and stuff and what we're supposed to say or not. Um, but I think we will see some stuff coming out in the next year. Maybe, I, I don't know whether it's a similar question, but uh, I, I think also like with a new Condensals algorithm just around the corner, and then some of the mud and dirt that you talked about in the past. Like, I, I think one, maybe, and that's a question that I heard a little bit there is like, when would you recommend it's production ready for some deployment? Like, how much time would you give the new algorithm, for example, or like, how do you see that? Yeah, it's uh, that's a really good question. Um, it's it's difficult to say when it's production ready because it, dep it really depends on the use case, right? So if your if your use case is good enough, uh, if if the current state of the network is good enough for your use case, you can use the network as it is today. I mean, it's not getting worse. So it's kind of up to a um, whoever wants to do something with it to determine what their requirements are. I need X number of TPS consistently. I need uh, w whatever kind of uh, let's say I need hardware that is this uh, this level and it's a very low level because. Right now, maybe you need a Java client with eight gigabytes of RAM to run a good IOTA node. So when that gets down to like a Raspberry Pi with 512 megabytes of RAM, maybe that's good enough for your use case. I don't know. So it really is up to the use cases um, to determine what is production ready. I mean, it's already in production, right? It's a cryptocurrency, so you can for the for the token value transactions that's already been in production for like a year, um, and it's. What, what most of the use cases do is do some kind of interesting thing on top of that, connected to external data or connected to data that they put in the tangle. Um, and it takes time for ideation of those things and to get those particular use cases down to a scale where you can actually roll it out. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, may, maybe a little bit. I, I think there were some very concrete issues like where transactions would stall out. And I know that there's still these IOTA servers out there that kind of support the network so it doesn't happen. So I was just worried, wondering from an R&D perspective, from your own perspective, when would you give like um, give the recommendation now you can run your car fleet, for example, right? That was right. the example. When okay, so uh, for me, what we've talked about um, in my team is that we would like to see a stable network for something on the order of three months where there's no major issues, delays, lags, whatever. Um, some stable high number of TPS and confirmed TPS. Um, I mean, it, and, and that really does depend on the use case. Like right now, maybe a good target would be 50. Uh, by the end of the year, maybe it would be 100 or something, and that could be good enough for certain basic use cases. Uh, I'd like to see that. 
on the network for at least a few months. And right now, um, our code obviously has been open source. A lot of people have looked at it, but we haven't done any like, uh, at least not on the recent versions, we've done it in the past, but on the recent version, especially on tip selection, we'd like to get some more um, professional mathematicians and cryptographers and stuff looking at it and uh, have those kind of audits done before I would recommend it for production use, I guess. Thank you. Sure. Okay, cool. So uh, I have, what, like five minutes left? Is that right? Is it five minutes? Five minutes, okay. So I'm going to run you through a demo real quick. Um, it's super easy. All I'm going to do is show you how to uh, get some IOTA tokens on our testnet, which we call uh, DevNet, because it's for, uh, for developing applications. So get some IOTA tokens and use our client library to make a, an IOTA token transfer. So you can take that and go home and try it yourself. So first thing you can do is go to docs.iota.org. Uh, you can see all of our client libraries down here. Um, yeah, it's not super clear, but the so we support two, uh, JavaScript and C, and the other ones at the moment are community supported. Uh, and if you want to run a node or use the wallet, there's some information there. So I'm going to use the JavaScript library. Um, so first thing you do, npm install, super easy, npm install. And I'm, I'm using here IOTA Core. This is our alpha version of the JavaScript library. Uh, the, the existing JavaScript library is kind of OK. It works. Um, it's not very modularized. It's a little bit ugly. It doesn't have types. Uh, so we've rewritten the entire thing in TypeScript over the last couple of months, uh, and it's ready ready to use now. Although it's still in alpha, it's, it's good enough to use uh, for especially for development or testing. Uh, so you can install Iota Core, and then I'm going to fire up my text editor and pull out the uh, Compose API method. And Compose API takes in an IOTA node. So for the for the DevNet, I'm going to use nodes.devnet.iota.org and uh, pass that into Compose API as a provider. And then I'm just going to run a quick check, uh, get node info to make sure that it works. So you can, you can go to, if you go here and you go to the JavaScript library, you can read the full documentation for it. Uh, but I'll do get node info and just log it out so I can see. OK, cool. So I have uh, IRE 1.5.0. You can see what kind of Java process is running. Um, you can see some uh, information about the current state of the network like the latest uh, solid subtangle milestone. Uh, and this is a little bit more complicated topic about the coordinator and stuff. Um, I'm happy to take questions afterwards, by the way, about that. So we get some basic info. So now what I'm going to do is generate a seed. And a seed is uh, a string of 81 letters, A through Z, and the number 9, all caps. It's, uh, it's in trinary. Um, not super clear, uh, maybe from that sentence, why, but OK. It is what it is, so you can write a little script uh, to get some random bits out of your processor and generate a seed. There it is. And then I'm going to take my seed, and I need to get an address uh, from my seed. So I know this is a little bit different to other cryptocurrencies. You have multiple addresses per seed, uh, and you should use each one only one time. It's a one-time signature. So I put my seed in, and I'm going to take that IOTA object that I instantiated from the previous uh, slide and pass in my seed and get a new address. And I'll log the address out. So there's my address. So now if I want to transfer IOTA tokens, I'm going to transfer to this address here at the bottom. So I'll go to the IOTA DevNet faucet. So this is uh, faucet.devnet.iota.org. And I'll put in the address. So that's the K-I-A-E-N, that one, K-I-A-E-N. <coughs> and I'll request some tokens. And then I'm going to check uh, that I got some tokens in there. So I'm going to put the seed in again. And then I'm going to do get account data from the seed. And this is going to go to the, to the database, check all the addresses, and get me a net balance. And so here I can see there were, there were actually some transactions uh, that came out of that uh, faucet request. Uh, I, I just showed the first one. There was a couple. Um, and the balance is 1,000. So I have 1,000 IOTAs now on this address, K-I-A-E-N. My presentation has died. Let's see why. It is all blank. Well, that's not good. Okay, 
So I can also go check um, check the balance online. So you can go to uh, a Tangle Explorer like devnet.tangle.org, um, and I can check that yes, I have uh, a thousand iota balance on there. You'll see the address is actually different because uh, I used a different one when I was doing it myself. All right, almost done. So this is the last step. It's super easy. I can make a transfer just like this. So the first line says transfer uh, to address KIAEN, a value of 20 IOTA tokens. Uh, depth to midwave magnitude is a little bit technical thing. And then here we go. Prepare transfer from my seed. Prepare this transfer. Send the trikes and log out the bundle hash. And there's my bundle hash. So running this command one time, that's it. I've got a bundle hash. I can check it on the devnet. And there you go. I sent myself uh, 20 IOTAs in like, what, how many lines of code is that? Like six lines of code, seven lines of code. I've sent myself IOTAs just like that. So it's super easy. Uh, this keeps popping up. And I'm out of time. So uh, I just wanted to invite you all, if you're interested, I know there's hopefully a lot of students here. Uh, we're hiring. Go to our website. We want you uh, to work with us. Thank you.